This evening we are, uh, well, again, continuing the theme that I was um, already reminding you of, what we began to look at this morning, uh, the fact that uh, in this life we are not to be seeking for our own glory, we are not to seek to be honored by men, even as the uh, Pharisees and the scribes who sought the honor from one another, but rather we are to seek that honor that comes from God. Now, how is it that we are to do this? Well, Paul gives us a good, I think, summary statement in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. What I'd like to do is read for you verses 23 through 33. But again, just want to remind you we are focusing on verse 31 this evening. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 23. This is what Paul says. All things are lawful. But not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this meat is, is, or this is meat sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. I do not mean your own conscience, but the other man's. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. May the Lord bless His word to our hearing this evening. Now, again, as I've already reminded you this morning, uh, we were looking at the fact that God wants us to live with a single purpose, a single goal in mind, and that is that we might seek the glory that comes from Him. Now, I think you know the problem is that uh, we are born into a world that really seeks its own things. Uh, this is the world we were born into, and when we were young, we did exactly as the world did. You know, I think that that's um, the tendency, whether we are raised in Christian households or not, because we are born, sadly, with, uh, well, with the world in our hearts. We have a sinful disposition, unless we happen to be born converted, which doesn't happen, in my estimation, or at least biblically, as often as we might like to think it does. So we are born with the world in our hearts, and we want the world, and that's what we seek coming into the world. Now, we also understand that when we first come to the Lord, those things don't just change automatically, and they don't change as quickly as we would like them to. The world still seems to loom very largely in our hearts. It takes a while for us really to be able to see what it is that the Lord wants us to see. Now, it is true that He opens our eyes when He converts us, when He gives us the new birth, the veil is removed, we see the glory of God, we see the beauty in the things that are of the Lord. Uh, we see that those are the things that, that really matter. And at the same time, we see more, uh, well, we see that the world is really the enemy of God and its glory is worthless. But again, it doesn't happen so quickly and so automatically. There is sort of a weaning process that takes place. And the more we begin to see these things, the more we see that what God says is true, the more we see uh, His glory and have that desire to give glory to Him, that resolve strengthens within us to seek more for His honor and His glory. And we begin to use what it is that God has given to us uh, more in that direction, looking to the promise or to the reward that He has actually promised to us uh, in this life and in the life to come. So again, what I'm trying to say is simply this, that um, these things uh, don't happen as quickly as we'd like them. And sometimes when we see, you know, people coming to faith in Christ, we still see a, a, 
in a large measure, the world still has hold of their hearts, but the ultimate goal is that they may see and that we may see what is really important, that it really is, as um, Jesus said to the Pharisees this morning, the glory that comes from God that really matters, not the glory that comes from the world. We have to get the world out of our hearts and that desire for the things that the world desires out of our minds. We need to seek that glory which comes from God. Now, this evening, as I said this morning, I want us to focus more on how we are to seek for this honor that God promises to bestow. Uh, I think the, the simplest way to put it is, as I've already put it, it's this. The way that we may receive more honor from the Lord is by giving Him more honor. The more that we give, the more we sacrifice, the more we, we seek to do what it is the Lord calls us to do, the more the Lord will honor us in return. Now, what that means is, of course, that we should do what Paul is exhorting us to do in this text this evening. We should seek to do everything that we do for the glory and honor of God. So that's what I want us to focus on this evening, basically two things. First of all, that we are to do all that we do for God's glory and honor. That is the way to receive honor from Him. But secondly, I do want us to consider just how it is the Lord wants us to do this, how we can do all that we do for the glory of God. Now, first of all, Paul says that we should seek to do all that we do with a single purpose of bringing glory to God. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, in the context, Paul here, of course, is speaking about, uh, when he's talking about eating and drinking, he's talking about that which is offered to idols, uh, animals sacrificed to idols, the meat that comes from those sacrifices. And he is very clear when he says that we are not to participate in two tables. In other words, we cannot be idolaters. We can't eat from the table of the Lord and also eat from the table of demons. Now, he isn't saying, and this is something that we do need to understand, he isn't saying that we can't eat meat sacrifice to idols. He says basically that in and of itself doesn't really matter. If you read chapter 8, you'll find that that's exactly what he is saying. But what he's saying is you are not to eat meat sacrificed to idols as though it is sacrificed to an idol, in other words, as an act of worship. Uh, to do that would be to commit idolatry and to be an idolater. Now, again, this goes very well with what we've been looking at over the past several Lord's Days. We can't be both Christians and idolaters at the same time. We cannot serve two masters. We cannot have Christ and the world at the same time. We cannot eat from two tables. Now, Paul also says that we should abstain from eating this meat sacrifice to idols if our eating would cause somebody else to stumble, if it should stop an unbeliever from coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because we eat meat sacrificed to an idol looking as though we are worshiping the same God that he is worshiping. Or if we should stumble a young brother or sister in the Lord by doing something that they believe to be wrong and yet in seeing us do it, be encouraged to do it even though they haven't really come to grips with the fact that doing so would not be sin. You know that if you do anything, that even if it isn't sinful, if you believe that it's sinful, for you it is still wrong. Sometimes the example of a stronger believer and cause a weaker believer, brother or sister, to sin against their conscience, and you don't want to do that. But both of these things, Paul is basically resolving into one principle, not eating meat as though it's sacrificed to idols, not eating this in front of a young believer or even unbelievers to stumble them, resolve into this. Make sure that when you eat or you drink, you do it all for God's glory. As a matter of fact, Paul says this really applies to everything that we do. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, we do need to take seriously what Paul is actually telling us here. 
This means that all that we do, not just what we do here on the Lord's Day, not just in our eating and drinking with regard to our relationship with uh, idols or, you know, the, the meat sacrificed idols. Thankfully, we don't have to deal with that. But we do have many other things that we do have to deal with. We live in a world that is averse to God. We live in a world where the people in the world all around us are doing things they shouldn't be doing. We need to make sure that what we do, in contrast to what they do, is done to God's glory. Now again, we know that God has given to us many reasons why we ought to do this and not just simply please ourselves. For one thing, you know that it is the only right thing to do. God is the only one who is worthy to receive honor. And He made you and gave you the ability to do the things that you do so that you might do the things that you do for His glory. That's what we read in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. Make sure in whatever you're doing, especially when you're serving the Lord, that you do it in a way that honors Him and you recognize that you wouldn't be able to do that except by His strength, by the ability He has given to you in the first place. That's the reason why God made you, is that you might glorify Him. That's the reason why He redeemed you, that you might serve Him and bring honor to Him, that you might be a trophy of His grace. Uh, we've already seen that if we violate this principle, if we do what we do for some other goal or some other purpose or some other end, whether it be eating and drinking to idols or whether we seek simply to do what we do for the glory and honor that comes from the world, that that is tantamount to committing spiritual adultery. Remember what James told us this morning as he was, uh, well, rebuking those who actually did these things. He called them adulteresses. It provokes the Lord to jealousy. And the Lord has betrothed us to Himself as a pure and holy virgin. He wants us to be faithful to Him. And, of course, being faithful to Him means doing what we do for His glory and, and not for ourselves. Now, we also saw this morning that if you do, in fact, live for the glory of this world, if you seek glory from men and not the glory that comes from God, Jesus says you can't be a true believer because love for God and the desire to be honored by Him and love for the world and the desire to be honored by them are mutually exclusive. It's like light and darkness. You can't love both. You cannot serve two masters. So again, there are many reasons why we ought to do everything we do for the glory of God. But for our purposes this evening, I did want us to focus on that one additional reason. And that is because if you are willing to do this, if you are willing to do all that you do for His honor and glory in this world, God will honor you more. Now again, this is how the life that God has given to us can make the biggest difference in this world. We talked about this morning the fact that if we give our lives to the world, if we seek the glory that comes from the world, even if we should gain the whole world, even if we should get everything this world has to offer, in the end it is going to mean absolutely nothing because it is worthless. It's worthless in God's eyes and that's all that matters. On the day of judgment, it's going to mean nothing. The only thing that's going to matter is whether we use the things that God has given to us for His glory and His honor, whether we have sought for His honor and not for our own. So if you want to make something of your life, then you need to focus on this. If you want your life to count for something, then what you need to do is give all that you have to Him. Honor Him in everything. Seek for His glory. If you do this, He will honor you and He will use you and He will make your life count for Him. Do you really want to make a difference in this world? Do you really want to make a difference for Him? Do you, you know, as you read the biographies of these great men and women of God that the Lord used, is that what you want to be? Is that how you want the Lord to use you? The way that you actually achieve this is by committing yourself completely to Him, 
having that as your single purpose and goal in life, giving Him glory. Now, I think we understand that. Of course, the question that arises from that is, how do we do this? How do we glorify God in everything that we do? Well, you know that God has actually written a book to tell you how to do that. It's called the Bible. The Bible contains everything that you need to know, everything you need to believe, everything that um, you need to know for faith and life. It teaches you how to give glory to God in everything because that is, as a matter of fact, what He wants you to do. So how do you do this? Well, we can only use generalities in the amount of time that we have this evening, but let me just begin by saying the obvious things. First of all, if you're going to glorify God in everything that you do, you need to make sure that you don't do certain things. There are certain things God tells us we must not do, and you know, of course, that those are the things that are sinful. Remember we saw this morning as He pointed out certain things that uh, as Christians we, we must not do. We must not love the world. We must not love the things of the world. We must not be conformed to the world. And we must not seek the honor of this world. The world is our greatest adversary as Christians. We live in this world, but we are to remain unstained by this world. We are in this world, but we are not of the world. We are not to go the direction of the world. We were children of wrath when the Lord found us. But He turned us around and delivered us out of the world that we might be those who would be zealous for Him and for His works. So we must not love the world, we must not indulge in the world, we must not seek the glory that comes from the world. If you want the honor that comes from God, if you want God to honor you, you will not find it in any sinful direction. He won't honor us if what we do is offensive to Him. At the very least, we can expect His fatherly discipline. And we need to be thankful that God does that because parents discipline their children because they love them, not because they don't love them because they want them to go the right way, not the wrong way. And if we go that direction, God is faithful to discipline us to get us to go the right direction. Now again, as we were considering this morning, how can we know what is sinful and what is not sinful? Let me just repeat this again because I'm afraid the things that, that I say are going to be forgotten. We, we forget, we lose these things. Uh, the Jews, of course, who lived prior to, um, you know, uh, uh, our notepads and various other, you know, mechanisms and so forth um, to remember things basically would memorize what they were hearing. They didn't have a copy of the Scriptures. The, the common, you know, Christian member of God's covenant didn't have their own copy of the Scriptures, and so they had to develop their minds to remember because that's the only way you'd be able to actually apply what it is that... Um, that was being said. And yet today we have so many things that, that uh, we can access at any time. We know that the sermon is going to be on, on the, the web. We know the notes are going to be there. And we're thinking, well, I can access it at any time. But what happens is we, we don't. And we tend not to remember. And these things fade away, especially as we have conversations following the service that, that really you know, don't focus on the things we've been looking at. At least that can happen, certainly. So how can we continue to, well, how can we remember these things? How can we uh, know the difference? How can we uh, understand what is sinful and what it is that God is uh, offended by? Well, again, as I said this morning, spend time with the Lord. You do need to spend time with Him in His Word. You do need to spend time with Him in prayer. You do need to walk with Him throughout the day and fellowship uh, with Him. Uh, you need to walk in the light as He is in the light, which means simply submitting to His commandments. You need to talk to Him in prayer. You need to let Him talk to you through His Word. And the more you do this, the more you converse with Him, the better you get to know Him and the more you understand what He is like. You know, we all have these conceptions in our minds what God is like. We think, okay, this is acceptable to God. Maybe this isn't acceptable to God. But do we really know God? Do we really know what is acceptable to Him? Do we really have in our minds the, the same concepts regarding God as He communicates in His Word? 
Because this is what He is like, what He says in His Word, not necessarily what we think. And we need to make sure that we have the right idea. We need to make sure so that we, may, that we don't do the things that offend Him, but that we do the things that honor Him. We're talking about how can we receive God's honor? How can we be the friend of God? How can we walk with God and be used by God? Well, we have to do those things and honor Him. In order to do that, we have to know what He is like. That's the easiest way, I think, of knowing. Or you can memorize the Bible. But I think that the easiest way is simply to know God's character because when you know it, then you will know those things that are contrary to Him immediately when you see them. So we need to avoid the things that are offensive to Him. Don't do what He forbids. And again, that generality we saw last week and this morning, do not love the world. Secondly, we need to understand that the things that we leave undone may be equally offensive to the Lord. You realize that there are certain things God forbids us to do, and we shouldn't do those things, and we know that. But how often do we think about the fact that He is also offended when He tells us to do something, and we don't do it? For one reason or another, we're just not willing. Now, I don't think we would all be surprised if we looked on a military base and we saw that a commanding officer throw one of his subordinates in the brig because he was unwilling to do what the commanding officer said. And I don't think we'd be surprised if a supervisor wrote up one of his or her employees because they're late for work or because they drag their feet on the job, they're just not productive, or they don't do what they're told. I mean, that doesn't surprise us at all because we know how authority works, don't we? But somehow we're surprised when God disciplines us or tells us it's wrong not to submit to Him for disregarding His commandments. Uh, we do need to remember that God is, isn't called our Father for nothing. The fact that He is our Father does mean that we're His children. It does mean that He loves us. It does mean that He will care for us. It does mean He'll discipline us too. But it also means that we need to honor Him. We need to submit to Him. We need to obey Him because He is our Father. Even as earthly children need to honor and obey their parents. We know that our Lord Jesus Christ isn't called Lord for nothing. He is the Lord, and we are His servants. And when the Father speaks, when our Lord Jesus Christ speaks, we need to honor them by obeying. And, of course, doing this out of love, not out of slavish fear. We need to do it out of love. So remember that it's just as unloving toward the Lord, not to do something that He commands as it is to do something that He forbids. We call these, of course, sins of, of commission when we do something that He tells us not to do, sins of omission when we leave out certain things that He calls us to do. Both are offensive to God. So if we are to honor the Lord, we need to make sure that we pay attention to both categories. And finally, we need to make sure that when we do what we do or don't do what we shouldn't do, that we do or don't do it with the right motives. We need to make sure that we love Him and want to honor Him. It's not enough simply to stay away from what's wrong or to do what is right. You know, just going through the motions isn't enough. Remember the Pharisees. The Pharisees did a lot of wrong things, but they also did right things that were still displeasing to God because they did them for the wrong reasons. As we saw this morning, when they prayed, they prayed for themselves. They stood out on the street corner and said, look at me, I'm a pious person, honor me for this. Uh, when they gave money to the poor, they didn't give it to God, they gave it for themselves, hoping again that those who saw them would honor them for it. When they worshiped God, they did that for themselves. They did nothing but seek glory for themselves from others. So it is possible to go through the motions of obedience, but to do them with the wrong end in view, we can do the right thing for ourselves 
and not for God. And so if we would honor Him in everything, whenever we're faced with a choice, we do need to make sure that we go through these particular categories. We need to make sure that we are asking ourselves the right questions. First of all, is this what I'm thinking about doing? Is this something God tells me not to do? Obviously, if it isn't, it's something we shouldn't do. Now, I thought I would bring up perhaps a few examples, maybe some close to home, especially with all the young people that we have in this particular church. Here's a question for our young ladies this evening. What if a young man comes to you, shows some interest in you, but he isn't a believer? Should you allow yourself to become interested in that young man? Well, no, the answer, of course, is no, and the reason why you shouldn't is because the Lord tells you not to. This is something He actually forbids, isn't it? He says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? You know, one of the things that you would need to ask yourself is, why would you even be thinking about it. Why would you even be attracted to uh, someone who isn't a believer? The attraction would be purely physical because that person would share nothing in common with the Lord Jesus Christ. They're utterly unlike Him. They are darkness and you are light, which is why, again, Paul tells us that we are not to be bound together with them. So that seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? And yet, how many times have young people who claim or at least profess to be Christians done exactly that. Now, you know this applies to young men as well. Should you become interested in and pursue a relationship with a young woman who is an unbeliever? Of course not. You should never even allow yourself to begin to desire this because this is what the Lord forbids. And why does He forbid it? Well, because He knows, first of all, it's going to make your life miserable but it's also, of course, dishonoring to Him. He wants what is best for you, okay? He wants what is best for you. How many young men and women, again, who have professed the Lord Jesus Christ, have married an unbeliever and have ended up in this relationship that they're bound to and miserable in? Or how many have done this and ended up with a broken marriage simply because they would not submit to what God had to say? I mean, usually they find out in the end that what he said was the right thing to do to begin with. If we would only learn to submit at the outset and do all that we do for the glory of God, we wouldn't run into these circumstances. So the first question is, is this something God forbids? Well, then in order to honor Him, I must not do it. Regardless of what I think I might gain by doing it, I'm going to lose much more. Secondly, is this something that he says I should do? And here's again another marital example or perhaps more a relational example. What if the person that you're interested in is a believer, but your parents don't think that the timing is right or that it's a good match? Well, what should you do then? Disregard what your parents say and do what you want to do anyway? No. The Lord says you need to listen to your parents because that's what the Lord tells you to do. In other words, you know what the right thing to do is. If you're going to honor the Lord in that situation, you yield to what God tells you to do and you do the right thing. If you do, God will honor you and He will bless you. You won't lose out. You will gain, always gain when you do it God's way. And then finally, the question is, okay, let's say it's wrong, I'm not going to do it, but it's right, this is what I should do. Am I doing it for the right reasons? Am I doing this just for myself or am I doing it for the Lord because I love Him and want to honor Him? Remember 1 Corinthians 13, you can do things that are good. And I already, I already pointed out the Pharisees as a negative example, but here's another example. 1 Corinthians 13. You can do things that, that are good, you know, things that God commands, but He says if the motive is wrong, if, if there's no love in your heart towards God, it means absolutely nothing to Him, which means it does not 
honor Him, even doing the right things. Abstaining from the wrong things or doing the right things for the wrong reasons can still be dishonoring to the Lord. You have to have the right motive. If you honor Him, He will honor you. So, is my motive right? Am I doing it for the right reasons? I need to make sure that I am if I am to honor Him. You know, I just um, was reminded recently uh, by, I forget exactly who I was, to whom I was speaking, but um, you know, we're used to hearing these things, but people who are outside in other churches sometimes look at us as we think about these particular things we're scrutinizing right now. Got to make sure I don't do anything that God tells me not to do. Got to make sure I do the things that He calls me to do. I mean, they look at that, especially when you say, okay, you got to have the right motive behind it. Aren't you getting just a little bit too technical here? Aren't you getting just a little bit, you know, too scrupulous? Uh, aren't you becoming fanatical? Some people look at us and think we're either legalistic or perhaps cultic. But I hope you understand that what we're talking about here is, is nothing close to either of those things. God has another name for what we're talking about here, and He actually calls it love. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Keeping the commandments of God isn't legalistic. Keeping the commandments of God isn't cultic. It's not fanatical. It is love. It's doing what God calls us to do for, of course, the reasons why we ought to do them, and that is out of love for Him. If we love Him, we will keep His commandments. And again, if we ask this question, how many of the commandments is Jesus talking about here? Absolutely every commandment? Yes. Again, when the Lord speaks and He says, don't do this, when can you do that with a clear conscience? If He says, do this and you don't do it, when can you not do it with a clear conscience? The Lord of the universe, this is what He wants for you to do, and He tells you this is the right thing. It's the good thing for you and for others. It's what honors Him. How can you not do that? This applies to everything. All that you do, do to the glory of God. Do all that He calls you to do in, in every area. You know, it's interesting, too. I've also run into Christians in the past who believe that somehow if they didn't know what God wanted them to do, that they were off the hook. I don't know if you've <laughs> run into people like that who say, you know what, I, I limit my, my Scripture reading because I, I don't want to learn too much and have to do too much at, at one time. And they thought that God wouldn't hold them accountable if they just were ignorant of what it is He wanted them to do. Now, I think you can see that, you know, our, our hearts are, are still sinful, even after God gives us grace. They still try to find ways to wiggle out of things, and, and this is certainly something that some professing Christians have done. I've, I've talked to them in the past. There are people who actually believe this, but can we do that? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a weird question, isn't it? Can, can we do that? I mean, can we just simply not know what God wants us to do so that we can live with a clear conscience and do what we want to do? Well, of course we can. Because God actually commands us to read His Word so that we will know what it is He wants us to do so that we might honor Him because it's not only honoring to Him, but it's also good for us. I mean, He does love us. And He wants us to do what's right. That's interesting, isn't it? Because um, throughout the Middle Ages, the church actually took the Scriptures away from God's people and didn't want them to read it because they were afraid it would be bad for them. Well, the Protestants, of course, during the Protestant Reformation knew that God gave His Word so that His people would be able to read it. And we find many exhortations of that very thing in Scripture. Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. He wants them to know what it is that God wants for them. The angel said to John regarding what he would write in the book of Revelation, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it because the time is near. God gave His Word in the language of the people so that they would be able to read it and understand it. The author to the Hebrews actually reproves his readers 
for not knowing more of God's truth than they already knew. He says in Hebrews 5, verses 12 through 14, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. For he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. No, uh, we can't excuse ourselves on the basis of ignorance. The Lord tells us He wants us to read His Word. As a matter of fact, He admonishes us that we ought to know more than we do. I've already told you that it's only by spending time with the Lord, by uh, you know, walking with Him, by speaking to Him, by listening to His voice as He speaks to us in the Word of God that we get to know Him and get to know what it is that He wants. We're reproved here for not doing this more than we do. The Lord wants you to know Him. That is eternal life, is to come into a saving relationship with Him, a personal relationship with Him that you may know Him, that is, that you may love Him and be known of Him. But I think sometimes we exclude the fact that God really wants us to know what He's like too, not just to know Him personally, but to know what it is that pleases Him and what it is that dishonors him. Luke commended the Jews at Berea because they searched the scriptures to see whether or not what Paul was saying is true or not true. That's what we ought to be doing with everything that we're faced with in this world. Every choice that we have to make, searching the scriptures to see whether it's good or it isn't good so that everything we do may be for the glory of God. So again, the point here is that we need to uh, you know, abstain from what God tells us not to do. We need to do what it is He calls us to do, and we need to do it for the right reasons. We don't avoid evil merely because we don't want to get caught in it and get into trouble. We need to avoid evil because we love God and want to do what's honoring to Him. We need to do what's right, not just to keep up appearances so the people will think well of us the way the Pharisees did, but we need to do what is right because we love God and want to honor Him. We want to do what would be pleasing in His sight. Now, the bottom line, again, is this, that if you will do this, if you will live with this one purpose, giving honor and glory to God... God will honor you. He will honor you, as we've already seen, with blessings in this life. You want your life to count for something? Well, then do what God tells you to do. Seek His honor. Do not seek your own honor in the way the world does. That is taking your life and flushing it down the drain. But instead, seek the honor that comes from God. That is the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that will matter at the end of your life. So it's the only thing that should matter at the beginning of your life, in the middle of your life, or whatever you happen to be. If you want your life to count for something, then honor the Lord. He will make it count here. And of course, He will also honor you in eternity in the various ways we saw this morning. So may the Lord grant to each of us that we may have this single purpose in life, to seek the honor that comes from Him by doing only that which honors Him. Well, may the Lord again grant us this mercy. Let's, um, let's bow in a few moments of silent prayer and let's ask that the Lord might apply this to our hearts as we need to hear it.